my little password program and re-log into my own Zoom. Okay, now I'm using computer audio. I do see myself. Can you see me? I'm not logged into Zoom. I will be right there. Okay, great. I'm going to hang up here. Okay. Hello, everyone. If you can hear me, you can send a chat message. We're just testing things out before we get started. Thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. And we're going to get started as soon as I get the uh, okay from Elliot, and he should be logging in anytime now. And the attending attendees are, uh, oh, Elliot, I see that you are now here. Good to go. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Great to, great to be with you again. Um, and um, we're in the webinar format, so it's a little different than the way Zoom typically operates. So um, I'm going to speak to you from here. Um, we are, for those who weren't here last week, we're in the second week of sort of a continuing series to uh, understand a little bit more on relationships between blacks and Jews. And uh, today we're going to look uh, at black power Jewish politics, reinventing the alliance of the 1960s, which was one of my, my most recent book. So I'm going to share the screen with you now and we will get started. Getting myself set up. Okay, so it was 1972. Um, I lived in the almost all white suburbs of Los Angeles, California, and uh, in that year, and I know I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, speaking to Chicago, but I'll just say, oh, this is where I, this is where I grew up in the beautiful Palos Verdes Peninsula. LAX is off there in the distance. And in 1972, that was the year that the uh, LA Lakers won their first national championship. Um, had a lot of famous players on that team. Oh, Wilt Chamberlain, of course, uh, one of the most famous. Uh, he scored uh, 100 points uh, in a single game, though I'm told he did that before he became a Laker, but we still, we still take pride in that. And the Lakers in those days played at Inglewood's Fabulous Forum. Um, they've moved over now to the Staples Center, but uh, as it turns out, they were not the only basketball team that played in the forum. When I was in the third grade, my mom took my big brother and me. All right, so this is not a third grade picture of us, but I just, I love the picture, and <laughs> so I put it up. She took us to see the Harlem Globetrotters. It was a fantastic experience. And now I'll date myself and maybe date you if you know these names. The skills and antics of Meadowlark Lemon, Fred Curly Neal, offered me, believe it or not, an early course direction in life. I loved it so much that after the game, I made a proclamation to my mom. When I grow up, I told her, I'm going to be a Harlem Globetrotter. Crushing my spirit, she replied, no, you're not. Why not, mom? And then she told me, because you have to be black to be a Harlem Globetrotter. And at that moment in the third grade, I knew that I was white, that the Globetrotters were black, and that it meant something. Well, apparently I was a slow learner. Um, I was raised in Judaism's reform movement in the 1970s, and this is my synagogue growing up, Temple Beth Ellen Center in San Pedro, California. And uh, when I went through religious school back in those days, the curriculum, other than the holidays, of course you did the holidays going through the year, had three specific goals. Number one, the Holocaust, every year, no matter how young we were. 
Advice to any Jewish educators who are listening now, showing the French film Night and Fog to first graders is not a good idea. All right, we learned about the Holocaust. Number two, we learned about Israel um, and, and, and the Chalutzim and the pioneers and the rebirth of, of the modern Zionist movement. Of course, um, one of the highlights of that was on Tu B'Shvat, um, we got the a Jewish National Fund, it was a card. I don't know if any of you remember them. They had slots for quarters. And if you filled 10 quarters in the slots, you would get a tree in Israel. So the mathematically challenged, that was two and a half bucks back in the day for a tree in Israel. Then the rabbi would say, you know, one day may you go and visit your tree in Israel. Uh, it was much later in life that I realized, because I went to look for my tree, you, you, you actually can't find your tree unless, unless you buy 10,000, then they'll put your name on the tree. And in, uh, in a more painful moment, I went into the um, synagogue office one time and actually found my tree in Israel certificate in what was called a typewriter at the time with my name on it. And then I realized that uh, trees in Israel came as much from the office than they did from Israel. Oh, well. The third thing we always learned about, of course, was Jews and social justice. And that was, you know, iconif but iconified by this image and several others that have Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel marching arm in arm. So with this upbringing, with this background and perspective, I arrived on the campus of Cal Berkeley in the fall of 1982. Cal Berkeley is a place where Mario Savio changed the world with the free speech movement. And here he is giving you know, one of his addresses. Uh, if anyone's been on the Berkeley campus, you may know this is Sprawl Plaza. And on Sprawl Plaza, Student groups take tables and they put the table out, they put flyers down and, and you walk to class and you see if there's any organizations you're interested in. And of course, for me, um, I went to the Hillel table, we called it the Jewish Student Board back in the day. Um, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you are, 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 are Hebrew literate. So while that does say uh, Berkeley on it, it could also say Barak Lee, the storm upon me, or broccoli, the vegetable, you can take your pick without the vowels. It works on all of them. So I started with the uh, Hillel table, and then of course I went to the next table I should go to, the Black Student Union table. And, uh, and there I walked up to one of my African-American classmates and said, let's start a Black Jewish dialogue. And he burst out laughing. And then he kept laughing until I have to believe he saw the shock, horror, and embarrassment on my face. With compassion, he did all he could do to control himself. And to ease a really awkward moment, he smiled and let me know, hey, I'm from Harlem. Now, I knew what Harlem was, basically. I knew this was a neighborhood in Manhattan, that it was a predominantly African-American neighborhood. But I also had a sense when he said that, that he was communicating something to me in a more deep way. That is that we were raised in two different Americas. For me, a white young man from the suburbs of LA, and he, a young black man from Harlem, who because of the logistics of a college education, brought, brought us both together in that moment. Well, in a gesture of kindness, he said, look, I really don't think anyone in my group is interested in black Jewish dialogue, but if you would like, I'd be happy to pitch it. I appreciated the offer. I said, thanks, but that's okay. And that ended the Black Jewish Alliance at UC Berkeley in 1982. And in one way or another, began the research I have for the current book, Black Power, Jewish Politics. Good evening. It's good to be back. It's good to see you all, even remotely. Um, today, we're gonna talk about uh, three things. We're gonna talk about history, historiography, and historical memory. And for those who were here last week, we had a little bit of it, and, and I'll give a quick review for folks who weren't here. Um, history uh, is the study of the past. It's kind of the easiest way for us to go. But when you're getting academic talks on history, we're really interested in, in a more complicated concept, which is historiography. Look at the word graph in the middle of historiography. Historiography is the history of historical writing. It is the fact that every generation of historians who write books on whatever their topic is 
are going to look at it from a different perspective, perspective informed by their generation, by their age, by their gender orientation, any identity marker you want, you will be able to see differences in, in, how they, in how they write. So what we're doing in this series over the weeks is really kind of walking through um, the, the different historiographic generations. And today also, we're gonna look a lot at historical memory. What we all remember about the past is our historical memory. The challenging part of it is oftentimes what we think happened didn't actually happen. What we remember happening didn't, or even if it did happen, or if we did remember it, it's actually one small part of a larger story which ends up becoming more compelling. So today is history, historiography, and historical memory. And one more thing, the historian's craft, violating the rules of academic history. When I was in grad school, we were taught that academic history is about putting yourself in a time and a place different from your own and then describing it. Historians, I was taught by my professors, are supposed to take a third person, detached, critical approach to their subjects. We train so that we can capture history really, really well, no matter what topic of history we're studying. I picked 20th century US history. All right, one of my colleagues, Professor Fred Astrin, he picked medieval Jewish history. Well, so what happens for Professor Astrid in medieval history when he gives public lectures, he doesn't get too much challenged on them because um, there's no medievalist left to contend he's speaking incorrectly. I write on the 1960s. I've got a lot of people listening who were alive and active and engaged in the 60s, and some of you may be as well. And, uh, and they have given me feedback on what they think about my thesis. Well. I shared a classroom, actually I had a classroom, you know, in the 10 minute passing period between um, with an African American man who is a professor of communication studies. And we chat for those five or eight minutes between classes, you know, twice a week. And one week he said to me, uh, next week my students are doing their uh, formal presentations. Would you mind keeping your students in the hall because we'll probably go late. I'd, I'd rather not disturb them. I said, of course. By the way, what, what's the project on? And they said, oh, my students are going to give an oral, oral report on how their race and ethnicity informs the way they communicate. Makes perfect sense in a communication studies class on race and ethnicity. I let them know that in the Department of Jewish Studies at SF State, we never have our students proclaim their Jewish identities in class. Because the moment you do that in a public university, the non-Jewish students in the class get marginalized or a sense that they're on the outside, or even Jewish students who are not so identified or are just learning. We end up creating an in-group and an out-group, the day school kids, the Jewish summer camp kids, and we want them to know that your job in the university classroom is to study academics and your personal identities don't matter. Well, he looked at me and smiled when I told him this, and he goes like this, and he says, my blackness is on every word I teach, and every word I publish. And then a couple of weeks later, when we got to know each other a little better, he said, Mark, your whiteness is on every word you teach and every word you publish, except you don't have to say so. Wow. And it turns out um, he was uh, really right about that because um, the first two words of my book title are Black Power. And I'm a white Jew talking about Black Power. To what extent does my status as a middle-aged white heteronormative cisgendered man play into how I'm gonna see these race relations? So I called my editor at Brandeis University Press. I said, I have to break the rules of academic history. I can't play like I'm detached third person critical inquiry, just like, I, like the medievalists are. Since I already had an introduction in the book, I said, I need to write a preface. And the preface needs to say all I can say about who I am approaching this material so that the reader will be able to use that information to make whatever assessments they wish. So that story I told you about the Harlem Globetrotters, about going to Cal Berkeley and trying to do a black Jewish dialogue, that's the preface of the book. And its intent is to warm people up and to set them up in this. So if you remember from last week, and I'll give you a quick overview if you, if you weren't here, um, I said that the first generation of historical writing on blacks and Jews was like the letter Y. 
And that is up here in the upper left-hand corner, let's just say these are African-Americans here. We'll put white Jews over here um, and they're apart. But as time goes on here in the center of the Y, they come together in the civil rights movement, King and Heschel, and they march together down through history. And uh, well, that works well in the first generation. It doesn't work so well after the mid 60s. Because of the rise of black power, black militancy, and lots of different things, the black Jewish alliance splits. So the second generation of historical writing on this topic has blacks over here, Jews over here. They come together in the middle of the X for about 10 years-ish, 1954 with Brown decision or the Montgomery bus boycott, 1964 with the Civil Rights Act, or maybe 65 with the Voting Rights Act. And then after the breakup, look what happens here at the bottom of the X. Today, Blacks and Jews are separate. And of course, now with Black Lives Matter and what's going on, there's a big debate about whether this bottom of the X can be fixed. So what I did when I started the Black Power Jewish Politics book is looked at all of the books that, that argued Y, all the books that argued X, and then tried to figure out what it was that I needed to do in the next um, generation. So um, because we're in webinar format, um, and in fact, what I'm gonna do right now is uh, see if I can bring down the chat box so I can see your chats. Okay, I can see your chats now. Um, great, okay. So um, feel free to type into the chat um, and we're gonna be as interactive as we can under the circumstances. So here's, here's how it's gonna go. Um, uh, if, if, if we didn't have COVID and we could be together, I would do this in Hevruta, but now we'll, we'll all just, we'll, we'll make this a Hevruta with, with all of us who are here today. I am going to give you a text. This is an historical quotation, but I'm gonna do two things to the quote. I'm not gonna tell you who wrote it, and I'm not gonna tell you when it was written. And what you get to do in the chat is write who wrote it and when. All right, you don't have to be, if you don't know like a specific name, that's fine. If you could have the type of person that would say it, that would be, that would be good. Now, I did this at the Hartman Institute last year and they're very smart at the Hartman Institute and they know that African-Americans, blacks are referred to with different names over time. And they could date the quote by what word was used to describe African-Americans. So I just have to be truth in advertising, let you know I've gone through the quotes and changed them all up. If indeed you could be tipped off on the year by what word was used. So to have no confidence at all in what that year is. So um, here is our first um, quote. Okay, and I'll read it out loud and you have it in front of you. Black power stresses black initiative, black self-worth, black identity, black pride. Black power seeks, seeks the growth and development of black economic and political power. Black power seeks black leadership development. Okay, start typing in who said that and when. Stokely, all right, Elliot is beginning us off. Excellent guest, Stokely Carmichael, 1965. And uh, for those who may not be aware, Stokely Carmichael was the founder. Um, Rachel's giving us Malcolm X. Uh, Rob, uh, Roberta um, is probably looking, starting at Stokely. This is great. So um, um, let's see. Black Power Stresses Black Initiative. Where this is absolutely a Stokely Carmichael kind of quote. This is absolutely a Malcolm X kind of quote. Um, Fred Hampton. All right, thank you, Abital. So let's see who, who actually said it. Um, and I'll put my, there it is. Oh my gosh, the American Jewish Committee, 1969. How could that possibly be? Let's go back. The AJC, a centrist, even center-right national Jewish organization in 1969, three, four, five years after. Thank you, Elliot. That, all right, so. I would like to thank those who said Stokely and Malcolm and, and Fred Hampton. The, these are what I call the correct, incorrect answers. Um, and this is history, historiography, and historical memory. When I was in the archives and I read this quote, I figured it had to be Malcolm or Stokely. And then I find out it's the American Jewish Committee. This undermines, I think, all of the assumptions that I had about it. All right, let's do quote number two. All right. Um, 
how would the anti def this is not actually this like just answer the question how did the adl respond to the rise of the nation of islam um so just give me like just a quick thing like what, what does the adl think about the nation of islam if you don't know nation of islam that's lewis farrakhan now it was malcolm x before it was elijah muhammad before that not well roberta yes that is correct because the adl's job is to fight against anti-semitism and the nation of islam um, was there and elliot's telling us in the early days it was positive for black self-empowerment thank you elliot that's why you are leading us um, on this tour uh, through history. So, um, so here's, here's what I found. Um, in the 1950s, Time Magazine did a, an expose on Elijah Muhammad, then the leader of the Nation of Islam. And uh, it was a pretty bitter condemnation of Elijah Muhammad. In the archives, I found confidential memos sent by the head of the ADL to their branch offices saying, Time Magazine notwithstanding, we have no documentable evidence of anti-Semitism on the part of the Temples of Islam movement or Elijah Muhammad. And uh, before I had the uh, intelligence of Eliot, um, I, was, I was shocked because when I was growing up, especially in the 80s with Louis Farrakhan, all we heard about was the Nation of Islam was antithetical. And now we have the ADL actually telling its, it, all of its field officers you know, to sort of cool off and mellow out. Um, was, was pretty um, amazing. So how would the American Jewish Committee respond to the rise of the Nation of Islam? We would think in a similar way to the ADL. Um, and here's what happened with the AJC. In 1959, Elijah Muhammad was scheduled to give a speech in what they described as a Northern New Jersey metropolis. Let's call it Newark, shall we? And, uh, and, and the AJC was concerned about his anti-Semitism and what they wanted to do was go undercover and surveil his speech to see if he's saying threatening things. There were no black Jews in the AJC office in Newark at that time to surveil and having a white Jew with a clipboard is probably not a good way to be incognito. So in a relationship that may cause some concern, the AJC partnered with the city of Newark's Human Rights Commission and together they surveilled Elijah Muhammad. Black man from the city of Newark's Civil Rights Commission went in and, uh, and here's what, um, that, what that report said. It said, in a speech in front of 1,500 to 2,000 attendees, Elijah Muhammad offered a cryptic statement that, quote, they killed Jesus and he was preaching good. Well, the AJC, it turns out, was uh, more concerned with the anti-white statements of Elijah Muhammad and they uh, proclaimed that uh, they did not consider that anti-Semitic at all. When 38 black Muslims were jailed in Lorton, Virginia, they were, quote, forbidden to wear medals symbolic of their faith. Even though that privilege was given to Catholics and Baptists, what would the response of the organized Jewish community be to whether or not jailed black Muslims should be able to wear garb? Now, all right, so we're far enough along in our lesson that you probably know where these quotes are going. So I have to give you sort of the Dollinger honor test, uh, which is to say um, that when we get to the ones when you put into the chat, you're not allowed to put the one in the chat that you know we're eventually gonna get to. You have to put in the chat what you first would have thought if you thought had the question like an hour ago before we even started. Because sure enough, um, Shad Pollier of the AJ Congress, here he is uh, shaking hands with, with um, Dr. King, um, wrote a letter to the prison warden demanding that freedom of religion in America extends to prisoners, it extends to blacks, it extends to Muslims, and as a national Jewish organization, he wanted the warden to know that he demanded that black Muslims be allowed to pray as they wish. Now, the case for religious freedom is certainly one that's been classically Jewish, but I don't know that today we would have national Jewish leaders reaching out to defend Nation of Islam um, imprisoned people um, for, for any particular reason. Okay, the next text. The long-standing African-American distrust of white people, born of oppression, is manifesting itself in a growing spirit of go it alone. Blacks were already, according to this person, reevaluating their alliances, and they had come to know their strength. 
in both the political and economic arenas. The person who wrote this um, quote predicted a period of mutual irritation and misunderstanding, followed by a spike in what this person called new and more active forms of black anti-Semitism. All right, so who's gonna say this and when? Feel free to put some comments or thoughts in the chat. An FBI agent, Elliot uh, get, tells us. Yeah, actually, that, that makes a lot of sense because this is really kind of an intelligence report. Um, and it's somebody who is, who is seeing things that are going on. Um, and this very well could be a report. Elliot, that's great. The, when I, as I've been doing this talk, we're, we're not, I, I haven't had that one before. Um, but something from the 1960s, great. And Roberta, do you want to want to guess where in the 1960s it would be? If you want to just put a year down there, because that, as it turns out, is going to be the significant part of this document. 1963, well done. 1960, Nathan Edelstein of the ADL. Now, here's what's important about this document in the historiography and in our memory. Um, what Edelstein is writing is that black power is coming. Yeah, you were close, that's right. Um, but now we're gonna get really detailed on, on, on the date. He, Edelstein is arguing that, um, that there's gonna be black anti-Semitism. There's gonna be tension. There are some fundamental differences between white Jews and blacks and, uh, and get ready for it, right? And the fact that it's 1960 is key because 1960 is the heart of the Kumbaya, peace, love, Bobby Sherman, King, Heschel years. This is when at least I was raised to think that we didn't have tensions between the two communities, that the tensions didn't come till the mid 60s, till 64, 65, that it wasn't until Malcolm and Stokely that we had problems. And I kind of was taught that Jews helped blacks until blacks didn't want the Jews and kicked them out with black power and black militancy and nation of Islam. And it's all the blacks fault, right? That's, that's how I was raised. And then I'm sitting here, and by the way, this was not private, this was published this was a, a this you know, like anyone, any of my scholar friends who were writing on this earlier would have found it because you just read what all the different organizations publish. And, uh, and there it is, we were living in Camelot then, Roberta lets us know. Um, so if it's true that in 1960, white male national Jewish leaders were predicting the end of a black Jewish alliance, then now we have to think again about what actually happened in the mid 1960s, maybe the stories we've been hearing have been different. Okay, next one. I am tired of the philanthropy of rich white men towards your race. I want to see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith cannot fight your battles for you. We will stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourself. Now, I don't want to give it away, but this person says we white men, so we know it's a white man. That, that much we do know. So if anyone has any ideas. Okay, so, so we have one is that it is patronizing. That's excellent insight. And that's gonna be quite significant as we do the big reveal. Um, yeah, yeah. So as you're thinking and typing in, we'll talk about patronizing. Um, even though this is a white man um, saying that, the, it, is, it is really in a sort of paternalistic tone. Well, here is it is. Joel Springarn, 1914. Who is Joel Springarn? The founder of the NAACP, along with Arthur Springarn and W.B. Du Bois, the first African-American to earn the PhD from Harvard. Uh, and this speech was given to an African-American audience. So on the patronizing comment, yes, this is 1914, and, and it certainly was, was clear then, and, and in fact, patronizing ideas of, of sort of, you know, white civil rights workers against African-Americans is gonna be an ongoing problem. But I am amazed that in 1914, not only a random Jewish guy, but the founder of the NAACP is already tired of the philanthropy of rich white men. He's all, you know, even as he's being paternalistic, he's actually moving things forward. He says, I wanna see you fight your own battles with your own leaders and your own money. We white men of whatever creed or faith, creed, that's kind of a, a term from that era, cannot fight your battles for you. We're gonna stand shoulder to shoulder with you until you can fight as generals all by yourself. This to me is a call for black power. This is a statement that he saw black power coming. He knew it had to come or he knew there wouldn't be racial equality without it. And he did that 50 years before black power. 
This one quote only by the Jewish founder of the NAACP undermines so much of what academic historians have taken for granted or have understood from a historical memory. So, all right, believe it or not, um, up till now is not actually the reason I wrote, or I began to write the book. My first title of this book was Turning Inward. And what I was interested was learning about the Jewish turn inward in the late 1960s and in the 1970s. Um, there was a whole lot of different movements where Jews became a whole lot more public in their Jewish identity and expression. And, um, and I, I sort of went through each of these to figure out what I wanted. And as I looked in each of the movements, which we're gonna walk through in a moment, I discovered that each one of them kept going back in one way or another to the black power movement. And as I saw Jews emulating black power for Jewish identity and Jewish purposes, I wanted to know how much of this new Jewishness in the late 60s and in the 70s was really Jewish. How much of it can we better describe as an American thing because it came from the 60s? Really, how much was it a black militant thing because it came um, from the black power movement? And my thesis of the book was that Jews borrowed from black power. And um, if Jews face purges from the civil rights movement, as we know they did in the mid 60s, then they should turn inward and have their own version of what black power was. Black is beautiful. That was a phrase from that time period. Guess what? Jews are beautiful too. So across the Jewish communal landscape, Jews internalized their own version of black power. And, uh, and that was like my theory until I came up with this quote. And here it is, our next quote. Perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture is in the fact that Jews are the people who are best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. All right, any ideas in the chat box? It's perhaps the saddest element in this whole frightening picture is in the fact that Jews are the people who are best able to understand the rhetoric of black power, even though they're most directly on the firing line of its attack. Who would have an insight like this and when would they have it? That is a tricky one. And as you're thinking, I'll tell you, when I sat in the archives, this was in New York City at the American Jewish Historical Society and I read this quote, it, uh, it, it changed things up. Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, both excellent, so I'll show you their picture. Yes, Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg. 1966. Rabbi Hertzberg, conservative movement, congregational rabbi, later Columbia University professor, author of Zionist Idea, one of the most important books on Zionist ideology. And his father was actually a congregational rabbi in the Deep South during the civil rights movement too. So now I'm going to take you back. I want you to know this is a rabbi. So, and once again, a leading rabbi. This is not like some marginal one you find to, to prove a point. And 1966 will be key. In 1966, at a time when the relationship between blacks and white Jews is really tense, he says the saddest element in this whole frightening picture, and he's always letting you know, I know it's frightening, but here's what's sad. Jews are the people who are best able to understand black power. Even though he puts it, Jews are directly on the firing line of its attack. He captured the complexity of black power in the Jews. On the one hand, Jews were victimized by black anti-Semitism from black power activists. Yet, he's sitting here in 1966 calling out to American Jews to say, guess what folks, you're missing something. So let's go to the next text. The positive aspect of black power is its search for ethnic identity. This we should be able to understand and approve. The American black today is in this respect retracing precisely the experience of American Jews a generation or two ago. Well, with the lead off you've had on the rabbi from before, I'll just let you know, this was Rabbi Roland Gittleson. Oh, Heschel, thank you, Rachel. An excellent guess, right? Um, the positive, let's, let's, let's do this as a Heschel thing. 
The positive aspect of black power is its search for ethnic identity. This we should be able to understand and approve. The American black today is in this respect retracing American Jews. That was Heschel, right? Heschel was the one who marched with King because he understood the inherent similarities between the two communities. And I think that, that we could make a very strong case that this would be Heschel. And I wanna make it as, as more provocative as I can, Rabbi Roland Gittleson, Temple Israel, Boston, Reform Movement, 1969. Because if you were here last week, we talked about Rabbi Gittleson. Rabbi Gittleson in 1948, oh, actually, so let me give you the critique of my book and then how he fits in. Um, did, uh, the question is, did Heschel think of, uh, in, in terms of Jewish ethnicity? Not so much, he was a religion guy, right? I'm sure, you know, I don't know exactly where he would have been on the notion of ethnicity, um, but, but, but he was a theologian, I think, primarily and at heart. Um, one could argue that when you're tracing black Jewish relations from the 50s to the 70s, that actually the people in the 50s are not the same people that were there in the 70s. Like people came up in the 50s and then they left in the 60s, a different group, and in the 70s, a different group again. So I'm not actually tracing any single person's thoughts over 20 years. I'm just tracing whoever was a leader in that time. Gittleson helps. In 1948, Harry S. Truman put him on the White House Civil Rights Commission. In the 1950s, he was the one who sent his congregants down to Mississippi. They got arrested. Um, and they were the ones who were in prison where he wrote letters to the local rabbi. Um, so if you're thinking there's ever sort of an old school rabbi who likes that the idea of King and Heschel uh, and is committed to all of the interracial cooperation, if you want to make a list of someone who won't like black power, as someone who will see black power as, as, as damaging and hurting, this is the guy I would put high on the list. Yet, and this is a sermon he gave in 1969, he is arguing there's a positive aspect of black power to begin with. And then he wrote this, we American Jews should be able to understand and approve. And he used the word Negro instead of black. The American Negro today is in this respect, retracing precisely the experience of American Jews. So now I'm finding old school senior rabbis who are, who are urging Jews to not only lay off black power in terms of being critical, but then seeing that Jews can be helped, but then seeing that black power is actually the story of Jews themselves, um, which I found astounding. What ethnic group benefit the most from affirmative action in the 1960s? And just so you don't jump to the obvious answer, Jews were not a designated minority group. Jews were not eligible for affirmative action in the 1960s. You had to be one of the you know, racially designated minority groups. So by the way, this is just to let you know, this is not in my book, but since it's related to the book, I just threw it into the talk. Um, African Ameri uh, affirmative action programs were created for African-Americans, mostly, generally, uh, that was the idea. Certainly Latin, what we now call Latinx communities could, could be beneficial. So of course, you know what the answer is. The answer is Jews, but it can't be Jews because Jews were not designated minority. Jews were ineligible. How could it be Jewish women? Women were a designated minority group, according to the federal government, and were eligible for affirmative action. Which means, if there's Jewish opposition to affirmative action in the 1960s because it's helping blacks at the expense of Jews, that's a gendered, if not misogynist and sexist response. Because Jewish women, because they were um, ready for college and grad school and professional placement at that time period in, in the mid to late 1960s, they were able to actually enjoy more benefit from affirmative action than even the African-American community. So no, looking at affirmative action through a gendered lens helps us really undermine the whole notion of meritocracy and the way in which white Jews were suffering at the expense of communities of color in the mid 60s because of programs like affirmative action. So now let's look at the uh, movements that came from, um, from the black power movement. And uh, we'll start with uh, Soviet Jewry. Um, in, when I was doing uh, my research in Cincinnati at the American Jewish Archives for my first book, for the one we talked about last week, um, I looked up freedom rides. And um, this was something called a card catalog, you may remember. And when we, look, when we looked in the card catalog, it said freedom ride November 1971, which is a typographical error, because in those days you did it on the typewriter, because the Freedom Rides were not in the 70s, they were, they were in the 60s. But I called up the folder, and the folder had on it Freedom Ride 1971. So whoever typed the first one wrong, you know, typed the second one wrong. And sure enough, 
when I pulled the flyer out of the folder, it was a freedom ride for Soviet Jews. A two month journey from Washington DC to Seattle where they staged rallies, gave speeches for social change. This bus though did not carry black and white Americans on their freedom rights as we had in the early 60s. These freedom riders lacked training in Gandhi and King. They did not protest the condition of African Americans in a racist United States. They appealed instead for the rescue of Soviet Jews. They appealed on anti-communist grounds, knowing that the US Congress and especially the US Senate would be less interested in Soviet Jews and more interested in anything against the Soviet Union. The strategy of the Soviet Jewry movement was to play on American anti-communism in order to get the US government to back freedom for Soviet Jews. All right, so let's play a story for a moment here. If your goal was to leverage anti-communism to get a political goal in DC, you should do it in, I don't know, 1954, or do it at the height of McCarthyism. Do it at the time when the country was most energized by fighting the communist menace. The Soviet Jewry movement did not nationalize and go public until 1964, 10 years later. Why then does the Soviet Jewry movement have a 10 year lag? Because as we learned last week in the 1950s, the last thing Jews wanted to do was go public in their Jewishness. They wanted to move to the suburbs, Christian suburbs, blend in as much as possible and do the best they could to have a Judeo-Christian idea where they have similarities with their Christian neighbors rather than doing something like this with the image. But by the mid 1960s, thanks to black power, ethnic racial gender groups across the spectrum, Latino, American Indians, later women's and second wave feminism, they all literally took to the streets in defense of their group. And I would argue that the Soviet Jewry movement is the Jewish version of the civil rights movement. In fact, Jacob Birnbaum, who is a leader of the student struggle for Soviet Jewry, said, many young Jews today forget that if injustice cannot be condoned in Selma, USA, neither must it be overlooked in Kiev, USSR. 28% of the Soviet Jewry, Jewry activists trained in the civil rights movement. So I see Soviet Jewry and civil rights as the flip side of the same coin. And Zionism. What caused the spike in American Zionism after the 1967 Six Day War? Well, here's an interesting, interesting challenge. In 1948, when Israel was created, American Jews were certainly happy. They certainly celebrated, mostly after the Shoah, the Holocaust, they were relieved. But they weren't dancing in the streets in 48, and they were not making massive aliyah either. So um, in 1967, after the Six Day War victory, the reaction of American Jews, and especially American Jewish youth, was so strong that even Jewish leaders couldn't believe it. In one hour at a lunch in New York City, they made $18 million in charitable donations to Israel. They did a public opinion poll. 97% of American Jews expressed strong sympathy for Israel. Can you imagine today 97% of American Jews strong sympathy? Wow. Um, 7,500 Jewish college students called their mom, said, send me my passport, because they got on planes and flew to Israel in order to support the effort. So I'm trying to figure out why would 1967 be so much stronger than 48? Um, and the answer for me was black nationalism. If African Americans were moving for, towards black power and black nationalism and purging Jews because Jews cannot be, white Jews cannot be in leadership of black civil rights organizations because blacks need to control their own destiny. These young Jewish kids realize Jews need to control our own destiny too, and they became nationalists. So here is Rabbi Dove Peretz Elkins, um, and uh, he was in Philadelphia at the time, and uh, he gave a sermon, conservative movement, black power is nothing more and nothing less than Negro Zionism. Um, Okay, so Brian's saying, how does a group like the JDL borrow from Black Power? So Brian, you're going to get my Radar O'Reilly Award for today. For, for um, if you don't remember the MASH TV show, he always predicted what was coming next. So hold on tight and we'll get to you. Well done. Um, so let's go back to Rabbi Arthur Hertzberg. 
Um, he said, he wrote, Stokely Carmichael, he called Stokely Carmichael, quote, the most radical kind of Negro Zionist. He talks exactly the language of those Jews who felt most violently angry at the sight of Hitler and most hurt by the good people who stood aside. Rabbi Gittleson, here he is, the black power advocate is the Negro's Zionist. Africa is his Israel. Shad Pollier, the guy that uh, wrote the letter to the prison warden, to the British people, he said, the Stern gang in Israel was no less extremist than the black nationalists, the so-called Muslim movement in the eyes of the American people. Ben Halpern, Zionist and author, black power's fundamental meaning is quite clear. It means exactly the same as the equally vague term of auto-emancipation with which Jewish nationalism began in the 1880s. Wow, I gotta tell you the chapter I did on, on, on Zionism was really the easiest because just the overt connections that the, the Zionist leaders in the late 60s were and early 70s were using with black power was so clear. But for me, the clarity came not with this image. I found this image. Um, the Education Abroad program at the University of California started after 67. And I don't know what, what you know, the schools in Chicago were doing. But this was a time when a lot of the universities were adding Israel to the list of the junior year abroad um, schools. And a whole lot of you know, college students were going to do it because this was their way of expressing uh, their Jewishness. So um, here's how it went from Berkeley, at least. They, uh, they show up, um, they're wearing bell bottoms, they got the necklaces, the beads, they got the long hair, um, they got marijuana, and they're going to Jerusalem to the now reopened Hebrew University campus on Mount Scopus in order to come go back to their Jewish roots, to be deeper, better, stronger Jews. And when they arrive in class on the first day, they're met by young Israelis who just left the battlefield. Clean cut hair, conservative clothing, years older, and are, of course are the intellectual elite of Israeli society. So I can tell you in the literature I was able to find among the Israelis and how they were responding to the young American Jews, they called, they were, they thought they were freaks. They absolutely thought they were crazy. And at that moment, if you were one of those young Berkeley undergrads showing up in Jerusalem, you would have realized that you were a whole lot American in that moment, then perhaps you were Jewish. So um, next, uh, okay, um, Return to Tradition. Yeah, it's my least favorite musical, but Fiddler on the Roof's gotta go in there. We'll talk about Fiddler on the Roof maybe in another lecture. Um, in the late 60s, Jews began to become more traditional. Um, they became more kosher than their parents, and I'm not sure of what, where your various journeys came with Baal Tuba uh, or not, but there was a lot of ballet tuva in this time period um, where kids, you know, were not going home on school vacation. Um, they were wearing Jewish clothing, they were wearing kippot, they were reading Jewish books. So let's talk for a second about Jewish books. Uh, the Jewish Publication Society of Philadelphia, one of the leading uh, sellers of Jewish books, um, their, their best selling book in this period is easy, it's, it's Torah. Um, the, the question for you, and please put it in the chat box, after the Torah, what was the best-selling book from the JPS um, in the late 60s and, and through the 1970s? Uh, any ideas for what book you'd like to nominate for most popular after Torah? Rachel, well done. You get it. Not too many people do. Chaim Potek is good and actually was a great bestseller, uh, but it wasn't published by JPS. The Jewish catalog was number two. And if you're not Rachel and you don't remember the Jewish catalog, I'll let you know. It's how to be Jewish with macrame. Yeah, it's the Jewish version of the whole earth catalog. And one chapter teaches you how to braid your own kippah and others how to bake and, and, and create your own challah. And, uh, and what's important about the Jewish catalog is to understand two things. If you're gonna buy the Jewish catalog, you're gonna buy it because you want to be more Jewish. It's do it yourself. And, uh, and you're only gonna to need to buy the book if you don't know how to do it already. So the generation that bought the Jewish catalog were raised in the 50s in assimilationist house, houses. And then through the mid 60s, they got engaged with their Judaism and they wanna do more, so they buy the book. 
And the fact that it's a do-it-yourself crafty, you know, book on the whole earth catalog is because this was a countercultural generation. So you combine counterculture with Jewish resurgence, you get the Jewish catalog. It was so popular, and you'll see it says the first here, because they had a second and they had a third. Um, and they also had a Jewish kids catalog. By the time they would be ready for the fourth Jewish catalog, enough years had passed that the kids who bought the first Jewish catalog grew up, got married, had kids, and sent them to synagogue or day school or summer camp. And by the time they grew up to their, what they were their parents' age, they don't need to buy no book to tell them how to be Jewish. They knew it already. So if you want to understand the Jewish revival, just look at the ebb and flow of book sales from JPS. Elliot asked, what about the Klezmer Renaissance and the Jewish ethnic assertion of the early 70s? Exactly. That's exactly what I'm describing. Uh, I didn't do music um, specifically, but I think it absolutely um, plays. Um, if you're interested, there is a documentary movie on Chava Nagila. I don't know if you've seen it yet. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, I'm not a, was not a fan of Chava Nagila. It's, same, it's my same issue with Fiddler on the Roof. I saw that movie and now I love it. And um, Elliot especially, it is Hava Nagila and Klezmir. And there's a lot of discussion between those two musical forms and some really good lines. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to uh, see if a streaming service has a Hava Nagila movie. Um, okay. Oh, good. Elliot's already seen the movie. That's great. So um, students in the new left. So uh, part of being a hippie in the 60s, this is my hippie picture. Um, well, Jewish hippies were disproportionate as well. And this is actually one of my friends is in here. That's how I got, got the picture. So this is a disproportionate number of Jewish hippies. Um, at the Jewish Federation of San Francisco in this time period, um, a group of protesters were upset that the Jewish day school in San Francisco was not receiving as much funding as they thought day schools needed. And that was because they considered federations a secular Jewish group for rich assimilated Jews that aren't interested in identity. So they did not have a sit-in at Federation. They had a pray-in at Federation. Erev Shabbos, they show up with candles and challah and wine. And they sit in in the middle of the building and they begin to daven. And they're making their point. Like one point is, it's a sit-in, we're shutting your building down. And the second point is, we're doing it in a Jewish way because we need to force you to take Jewish education and Jewish identity more seriously. Um, as one rabbi said, why do we condemn black kids who suddenly wear their hairdo African or wear African clothing? For him and for a whole lot more Jews, he thought they could, quote, take advantage of the whole black thrust for non-assimilation. That was Rabbi Israel Dresner in 1969. He was from the reform movement, and he said that because he wanted yeshivot. He said it's time for reform Jews to create yeshivot in order to learn. And now um, we'll get to um, Brian's point. Because, yes, you're absolutely right. The black left informed the Jewish right with the Jewish Defense League. Mir Kahani, a nationalist who was also racist, anti-Arab in Israel, and in one sense loved black power. Because in many ways, the Jewish Defense League modeled the black power approach and tactics. In fact, Kahani really appreciated the Black Panther Party of Oakland because they took weapons, shotguns, and used them to protect African-Americans in Oakland from police abuse. And Mayor Kahani is trying to protect Jews from abuse. And he has armed militia, you know, marching in the streets, mostly in New York City. But um, he, the idea he just loved. So here we have the irony, even though Kahani certainly would not be seen as somebody who was an advocate of Black power or, or even civil rights movement, um, he was one who, who um, borrowed liberally from it. Uh, Shaul Magid, at, who's at Dartmouth now, he's actually working on what will be, I think, the, the biography of Mir Kahani. I'm not quite sure how far he is, but um, Brian, if you're interested, Shaul Magid at, at Dartmouth, and, and um, he would be good. So what letter of the alphabet is going to now um, reflect uh, Black Jewish relations? We've had an X. We've had a Y, which means we have to do Z. Now, because we had an X and a Y, I, uh, I kind of thought I got to figure out a way to make the Z work. When I ask people, some people like H, and they make an argument for H. So I'll use my pointer here to show you how the Z can work. Oh, here we are at the top, top left of the Z. Blacks and Jews marching together, 
There they go. Oh no, Black Power, they're, go they're, they're going backwards over here at the bottom of the Z. But look what happens after Black Power. Blacks and Jews are marching in parallel to one another. So they're not together, right? The top and bottom of the Z are apart, but they are on the same journey. So my argument there is that we went from the Y to the X to the Z. My question for you now, it's rhetorical, you don't have to put it in the chat. What happens after Z? I finished the manuscript. Every time you finish a history book, you have to do an epilogue. The epilogue is like from whenever you finished your book to today, and I finished the book like around 1980 or so. So I need like a 1980 to the present epilogue. It's not scholarly or ac academic, you just gotta catch up. And um, rather than just do a boring epilogue, I actually found my idea in a lunch that I had with Ilana Kaufman. You may have already heard of Ilana Kaufman because she is now a prominent national figure since she is the founder and president of the Jews of Color Initiative. Uh, and um, boy, I tell you, um, it is tough to get her book now because she is like on multiple Zoom casts every single day. Well, um, Ilana and I were having a nice lunch uh, in Berkeley and we were talking about this march that was going on. It was the 50th year anniversary of the Selma March, the famous King Heschel March, and the uh, URJ, the reform movement, and the NAACP um, were going to recreate the march 50 years later, march from Selma to Washington. There they're gonna rally for voters right, voting rights legislation. That all sounds great, um, except it's not 50 years ago. To look at it historiographically, I feared that this march would be the why and that it would ignore the X and the Z that came later. And as Ilana expressed to me, and I share with her permission, she's like, where am I in this? Where are black Jews in this? In fact, uh, we knew what, I knew what was gonna happen. These, these reform rabbis, many of them are friends of mine, are gonna come back from their march. They're gonna give their high holiday sermons. They're gonna proclaim themselves Heschel. They're gonna say they prayed with their feet and that's not what Heschel said. And, um, they are going to be, you know, social justice warrior saviors. I just want you to know all my reform rabbi friends that I called and talked to afterwards, they had the correct response, which is, oh my gosh, we've just been immersed in what it's like to be black in America. We have a whole lot of work to do and a whole lot of learning to do. Time to get started. That's kind of where they're at. Alana said to me, um, well, it's about the Facebook pictures. Because we know every rabbi is going to put their Facebook picture. No offense to this rabbi. I don't even know who it is. There's so many of them on Facebook. It's going to be white rabbi with a Torah in the middle and a black NAACP member on the other side. And as Ilana asked me, where am I in this picture? Where is a black Jew? In fact, she took the critique even stronger. She said, Mark, you wrote 200 pages on blacks and Jews and not a single page on a black Jew. What happens if you look through each of your chapters through the perspective of a black Jew? And in my defense, I said, I'm interested in how Jewishness is really Americanness and Americanness is really black power. That's what the book was. And she said, what if Jewishness is really whiteness? What if it's a racial lens rather than a nationalist lens? How would that be? And I said to her, you are absolutely right. To write a new history of black Jewish relations from perspectives of Jews of color now puts racial privilege and whiteness at the center of the book, rather than the line between Jewishness and Americanness, which is what I put in the center of the book. And I said to her, I said, Ilana, that's my epilogue. So if you read the book and read the epilogue, it's Ilana's story, and it's the story of this march. And it's an invitation now. Technically, I suppose I could write it, but probably it's going to take an African-American Jew to understand the subtleties that I clearly didn't see when I wrote it. And, um, and then, of course, they're going to have to come up with their own new letter, uh, however they want to see that. So I argue that when American Jews thought they were becoming more Jewish, they were really becoming more American. Only in America and only in the 60s could they be so Jewish. This isn't a story of a Jewish ethnic revival. This is a story of Jews assimilating to Black nationalism. There was a Black Jewish coalition after the mid-60s split. It just looked a whole lot different than we thought. So with that, I thank you for your time and your attention. 
Um, because we um, have a technology challenge and that I can't uh, hear you, um, I'm gonna offer two, two options. First, in the chat box, absolutely um, type questions you have and I'd be happy to answer them. And then Elliot, if you want, you can just call me on the phone right now. If you, if you and I wanna communicate in real time while I'm chatting here, we can do that too, depending on whatever is best for the group. Okay, we have one new, oh, sorry, I was not scrolling down. Uh, questions in chat is easier, great. So um, put your questions in the chat and then, um, and then and I'll give you my answers. Okay, any thoughts about the emergence of Jewish ethnic pride in relation to Chaim Soloveitchik's theory and rupture and reconstruction, they overlap in time? An excellent question. And I've had some anecdotal um, feedback from, from scholars um, uh, on that. I have not given it precise study, um, so I, I can't answer directly. But from those that I've heard from, um, they, they are arguing, in fact, and they're finding in Soloveitchik's writings that there could be um, that, that, that there is influence here as well. Um, and in terms of the historiography, that would actually be a great place to go, which, um, all right, so let me pause on that for a moment. Um, where are the Dati, the Orthodox community, um, in, this, uh, in this story? So in the 50s and from last week's presentation, we learned that there are almost no Orthodox identified Jews involved for a variety of reasons. What um, I found really fascinating was that changes with black power specifically in the Soviet Jewry movement. You, we are seeing, even at YU, activism um, among Orthodox Jews uh, and making uh, explicit connections with Soviet Jewry, Cold War politics, and traditional Jewish rabbinic text. And they're using a lot of the traditional Jewish text, even on the signs and the posters, um, and even as themes for the rallies and the demonstrations. So this is a moment, the Soviet Jewry movement is a moment that brings orthodoxy much more into the public square and into social protest um, because, because of, of the Soviet Jewry um, idea. So let me go back here because a few of them have come in. Um, so let's check. How do you see the recent attacks on Jews, some of them directly in the context of your study? I don't know what the recent attacks are, Brian. Um, I hope that's not a literal, if you're talking about the literal attacks like the synagogue shootings, or if that's a metaphorical. So if you could give me more, I'll keep going down. Could the enthusiasm after 67 been higher than 48 because of the feeling that the country was safer than in 1948? Sure, I mean, that's, that's a good uh, counter argument. Um, I, I, I really believe, I mean, for me, 67 was all about the rise of black power because that, that's what energized everybody. And 48 was just post-Holocaust trauma and fear and concern and need. And I just don't really, really think that you, you, they can afford to have the kind of celebration. I think relief was probably on an emotional level a much better place to be. Um, at what point in the history of black Jewish relations did outright anti-Semitism rather than generalized tensions appear in segments of the black community and what were the causes? Okay, thank you, Michael. So uh, Evan Trailer. Um, who just started this week in rabbinic school for, at HUC. Um, he's been a national leader in the reform movement, even through high school, uh, and now a leader in the Jews of color community. He's an African-American Jew. And he put up on his Facebook page, and it's been put around, Evan Trailer, T-R-A-Y-L-O-R, um, uh, um, why we should not be using the phrase black anti-Semitism. And I love the way Michael fr framed that, because it's actually right aligned with what Evan was saying, that, um, that black anti-Semitism creates a stereotypical anti-Semitism for an entire group of people. And certainly for Evan, you know, he's a black Jew, so that, that doesn't work. Um, what we have in the studies of, of anti-Semitism and different parts of the African-American community, um, one is religious. Um, and this would be the same place that a lot of white Christian anti-Semitism comes through to. Um, notions of Jews as Christ killers, notions of the medieval tropes as well. Um, as Jews have faced issues from certain readings of Christian theology 
as anti-Semitic, that's going to happen across racial lines too. I think in the mid 60s, the greatest locus or, or focal point of this was in urban areas that used to be Jewish neighborhoods that became African American neighborhoods once Jews left for the suburbs. So even though those suburbs used to be anti-Semitic and racist, and we'll talk about this next week a little bit more, um, they became not so anti-Semitic, at least Jews could move into them, but they still remained racist. So white Jews left the cities and then they kept businesses in the cities and then the prophets went out to the suburbs. So this was a moment when there's a lot of tension when most African-Americans primary relationship with a Jew was as a landlord or the business owner. And clearly there were, as there are in all communities, some Jewish landlords who were not keeping up the properties. And then you combine that with stereotypical notions of Jews and money and power and the negative stuff. And then, you know, and then it, it comes out from there. Um, also Black Lives Matter. Thank you. The number one question I'm getting in all of my lectures, Jews and Black Lives Matter. So I'll give you my Black Lives Matter response, um, which is also what we're going to do next week, but I'll give you a quick one, a quick answer now. Black Lives Matter is actually, um, we might be able to call it a movement. There, there, there's actually a number of different civil rights organizations that have all been operating on a banner of it. One of them called the Movement for Black Lives um, created a 40,000 word platform. And part of the 40,000 word platform had an anti-Zionist um, and in some ways anti-Semitic trope. And that caused great consternation among American Jews um, to the point that many thought that they should not support the entire Black Lives Matter. The feedback that I've been getting both from white Jewish activists involved it as well as African-American Jews is, you know, look, we should condemn anti-Semitism everywhere and anywhere. If the goal here is that Black Lives Matter and we need to stop the killing, especially of black men in the streets of America, then let's do that. Um, and let's deal with the anti-Semitism and the anti-Zionism as well. But guess what? If white Jews say, because some in the Black Lives Matter movement are anti-Zionist or even anti-Semitic, for that reason, none of us are gonna help, um, that's an expression of privilege. And the white activists say that's actually counterproductive because what they wanna do is they wanna be side by side in allyship. And then when they're side by side in allyship, when anti-Semitism does rise, as it rises, then you turn to your partner and say, hey, look, guess what? You know, you've got to step, step, stand up for us. And I'll close for now by talking about Zach Banner. You may have heard of, of Zach. He plays um, off on the offensive line of the Pittsburgh Steelers. If you don't have Zach Banner, Z-A-C-H-B-A-N-N-E-R, go look him up. He put out a video on why it is that African-Americans in the Black Lives Matter movement um, should not be anti-Semitic. It was about Deshaun Jackson's uh, comment. And um, the video nearly moved me to tears. And I'll also share with you that two days ago, I got a call from the NFL. They're concerned about anti-Semitism. So yesterday I taped um, four interviews. It turned out to be four interviews with Zach Badner, Mitch Schwartz, who is a white Jewish um, lineman for the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, and, um, and an NFL commentator, and we talked all about it. Um, two, two of the four have now aired, and they're on my Facebook page if you want to look. I think actually the third one aired, and I think just before we started now, I put it up on Facebook. So go read Zach Banner or go read those, and you can see those. And we can continue this next week as well. Elliot, shameless plug, next Tuesday night, Rob Ari is interviewing Susan, Susanna Heschel. There you go. Following Tuesday, um, Rob uh, Avi Weiss talking about his role in the Soviet jury movement. Wow, wow, wow. Um, so, uh, so Professor Heschel is at Dartmouth. And of course, she is Rabbi Heschel's daughter and get the entire congregation to hear that. And, and Rob Weiss, um, who, who was, in fact, when I was just telling you about how sort of that was the Orthodox place, I should have just mentioned Rob Weiss right then. Um, attacks by blacks in the past six months, New Jersey grocery store. All right. Um, in the Hanukkah party stabbing. Um, we're not, okay, one moment. I'm gonna take some, uh, okay. <laughs>